In 2021, Jim Knowles' Oklahoma State defense was one of the biggest surprises of the year. Knowles took over the Cowboy defense in 2018, and since then they've gradually been climbing the rankings from number 112 in total defense in his first season to number 44 in 2020. Although the trend was clearly positive for all of those years, though, I don't know that anybody really saw the 2021 season coming. In that year, Knowles' Cowboy defense finished number four in the country, and this improvement earned him the job as Ryan Day's new defensive coordinator at Ohio State. In this video, we'll look at the kind of defense that Knowles runs, we'll see where it came from and how it developed, and we'll close out by looking at some of the changes that he made in 2021 to take his defense from middle of the road to elite. To start, let's talk a little bit about Knowles' defensive pedigree and the origins of his system. The first thing to know is that he's been the top dog on defense at every job that he's had since 2004. That year, he became the head coach at Cornell, and since that time, the only guys that he's worked for have been offensive head coaches. This means that for the last 18 seasons, nothing's entered or exited the playbook without his initiative, so that's a long run of development, adaptation, and innovation that makes this defense uniquely his. Later in the video, we'll get into some film study to see the finished product of all of that in 2021, but to understand what his starting point was and where his early influences were coming from, we need to go all the way back to a coach named Gary Darnell, who Knowles thanked in his speech when he was a finalist for the Broyles Award last season. Darnell's been retired since 2007, but in the 80s and 90s, he worked his way up to some pretty high-profile positions, serving as the defensive coordinator at schools like Florida, Texas, and Notre Dame. These personal accomplishments aside, Darnell is especially important because of the group of coaches that sprung up around him when he was the defensive coordinator at Kansas State back in the late 70s and early 80s. If you look back at those Wildcat teams, you probably wouldn't think that anyone from those staffs would go on to have much success, but while the teams themselves were mediocre at best, head coach Jim Dickey must have had an eye for coaching talent because a lot of the assistants on that staff went on to notable careers. On the offensive side of the ball, one of these assistants was Dennis Francione, who would eventually become the head coach of places like TCU, Alabama, and Texas A&M. On the defensive side of the ball, the coach that had become the most accomplished was then just a young grad assistant by the name of Gary Patterson, who got his first significant coordinator jobs from Francione, first at New Mexico and then at TCU. Also on the defensive side, the defensive line coach for that Kansas State squad was a guy named Dick Bumpus, who gets less notoriety than Patterson, but works side-by-side -side with him to develop his famed 4-2-5 defense. In fact, Bumpus and Patterson generally worked together as co-coordinators, with Bumpus calling the front and the pressure, while Patterson called the coverage, so those two together were responsible for a lot of great defensive seasons. Now, of course, Jim Knowles was still in high school when all these guys were coaching together at Kansas State, so he didn't join the group until a little bit later. Knowles is an Ivy League guy who played his college ball at Cornell from 1983 to 86, and soon after graduation, he returned to Cornell to start his coaching career. For a part of that time, he worked under a defensive coordinator named Chuck Drisbach, who'd previously been an assistant for, you guessed it, those same Kansas State teams with Darnell, Francione, Patterson, and Bumpus, and it was through this connection that Knowles' career started to gain momentum. In 1997, Darnell became the head coach at Western Michigan, he hired Drisbach to be his defensive coordinator, and Drisbach brought Knowles over to coach the defensive line. After four seasons, Drisbach left Kalamazoo actually to join Patterson's staff at TCU, and Knowles was tabbed to replace him, making this his first coordinator position. It was during this time at Western Michigan that Knowles was first exposed to Patterson's 4-2-5 defense in a significant way. In 2000, Patterson met with the whole Western Michigan defensive staff to teach them what it was that he was doing at TCU, and the Broncos started to run more and more of that TCU defense over the next few seasons, and that shift is obvious on film. Here we're seeing a game from before that clinic, with the Broncos facing Marshall in the 1999 MAC Championship. The broadcast lists their defense as a 4-3 here, but that doesn't fully represent what they're doing. Here we see that they've got three down linemen playing with a hand in the dirt, and then two versatile edge players who are both in two-point stances and will regularly drop into coverage throughout the game. They call one of those guys a defensive end and the other one a linebacker, but they're really playing with 3-4 principles here, and in long yardage situations, they'd actually sub out that defensive end and play with 2-3-4 personnel, so they were really more of a hybrid 3-4-4-3 team with versatile edge players that let them switch back and forth between the two. One year later, after their meeting with Patterson, the Broncos again faced Marshall in the MAC championship, but this time they were much more of a pure four-down team, often substituting out a linebacker and replacing him with a nickelback to put them in an actual 4-2-5, and this really became their identity over the next few seasons, including during Knowles' time as defensive coordinator. While Knowles does have this very clear and direct link to Patterson, though, we have to be careful about overstating it. That clinic was more than 20 years ago, and since then, both coaches have had to separately develop their defense as offenses presented them with new challenges, from the spread passing game, to the quarterback run game, to the rise of the RPO. In Knowles' case in particular, I think that we can see lots of influences from other modern families in nickel defense, and he's also innovated some things in his own right that are pretty unique to him. Let's start getting into this by looking at Knowles' personnel usage. 
The most unique position in his defense is a hybrid edge position that he called the Leo at Oklahoma State. So in the front, the defense will play with three down linemen, two linebackers stacked behind them, and then the Leo is their sixth defender. Here I'm showing you that guy playing on the edge, and in this role, he's not really any different from the many, many hybrid edge defenders that you'll see all over college football nowadays. On some plays, that guy can come as a fourth rush off the edge, and on other plays like this one, we'll see him dropping into coverage, playing in space, and limiting plays in the flats. What's unique about Knowles' Leo position, though, is the number of other things that he can do with him, and he really ends up as a utility player that lets Knowles create an extra first-level defender wherever he wants to within the front. On this play, for example, Oklahoma State's using their three-down linemen to play an odd alignment. So they've got a nose tackle lined up directly over the center, and then two defensive ends lined up outside of the tackles. It looks like the Leo, then, has been given a call to go to the run strength, meaning that Knowles wants him to go wherever a run is most likely to attack. Before the snap, the running backs lined up in a pistol alignment behind the quarterback, and so the Leo's lined up toward the top of the screen, where Texas has more run blockers. Again, here he's lined up to the run strength as an extra defender wherever the run is most likely to go. Just before the snap, though, the running back jumps into a shotgun alignment offset to the quarterback's right. From this alignment, it's much more likely that any run play will go to the left, and so the Leo reacts by moving across the formation to the new run strength, again, putting himself wherever the run's most likely to go. And what he's really doing here is presenting an extra body and occupying the guard to that side. This is going to be a run to the left, and so after the snap, we see that left guard working to his left and keeping his eyes on that Leo backer exactly as we're expecting him to do. What the Leo's really doing here, though, is keeping that left guard from noticing something else, because after the snap, Knowles is taking this defensive end, who starts the play lined up outside of the left tackle, and he's stabbing him down inside. The left guard isn't going to see this, though, because he's working toward that Leo, and so that stunting defensive end will be able to get into the backfield cleanly to disrupt the play and force a cutback to pursuit. As I said, having the Leo as this utility lineman is going to let Knowles use his stunt package to take away all sorts of different blocking schemes. On this play, for example, the running backs lined up to the right side of the formation, and this time the Leo's going to travel to that same side, and here what he's really doing is protecting this linebacker behind him. Oklahoma State's in another one of those odd fronts, with a nose tackle lined up over the center, and defensive ends lined up outside the tackles, and Iowa State is running to the left against this front. If we look to the left side of the line, we can see that here the left tackle is going to have to block the defensive end outside him, the left guard is going to have to block the linebacker right here, and the center is going to have to block the nose tackle. The question then becomes, who's going to be able to block this second linebacker who's lined up to the back side of the run? Well, with the left tackle, left guard, and center occupied like this, it's going to be up to either the right guard or the right tackle to climb up to the second level and cut that guy off. So what does Knowles do? He sticks the Leo right in between those two blockers, preventing either of them from easily releasing past him and getting up to the second level. He is then going to blitz this playside linebacker. Now remember that against this front, the left guard's going to be responsible for that guy, and so when he blitzes down to the inside, the guard's going to have to come down inside with him. Knowles is then going to take that backside linebacker who's protected from cutoff blocks by the Leo, and he's going to scrape him over the top right into the open lane that the running back's trying to hit. When you line that guy up at multiple points in the front like this, it's also going to impact your coverage, because when he lines up in the middle of the formation, he can't just be a flat dropper. On this play, for example, we see the Leo mugged up over the right guard up here at the top of the screen, and after the snap, he's going to drop out into the middle of the coverage. From here, he's in a good position to spy the quarterback, and on this play, when that guy looks to scramble up and out, the Leo's going to be right there to make the tackle. Of course, at this point in the history of football, none of these things are really weird. It's not weird to have a hybrid edge player, it's not weird to walk a linebacker up over a guard, and it's definitely not weird to use a guy to spy the quarterback. What's unique about the Leo position, though, is that it's the same guy who's being used to do all of these things. Because that guy can line up in so many different places, Knowles doesn't want to overload him or overcoach him. He's just plugging him in wherever he needs an extra first-level defender, and then his primary job is to make simple reads and get to the ball. If you want to learn more about how the position's coached, Knowles actually made a pretty good clinic video that you can buy, so if you want to hear all the details, I'll link to that in the description box down below. In coverage, Knowles has a reputation for being really aggressive and playing a lot of man, but in the Texas and Iowa State games that I broke down, that really didn't stand out to me. 
Back in August, Knowles himself did sit down for an interview with the Stillwater News Press where he said that the Cowboys had played more zone in 2021. This was partially because they weren't experienced at cornerback and partially because it was Knowles' fourth season, and so he'd had a few years to get his whole defense installed, but this switch was also because of the conference that he played in. In that interview, Knowles said, quote, We've made adjustments as I've learned more about the Big 12 to go to more zone. We're still mostly man, but we've made adjustments to go to more zone. I found these comments about the Big 12 to be especially interesting because to me it looked like Knowles was taking zone principles from the three high defenses that had become so common in that region. To see what I mean, let's switch over to look at Oklahoma State's secondary play. Here we're seeing a coverage that easily could have been run in Patterson's TCU defense. So we've got a pretty traditional four-man secondary with a cornerback and a safety to each side, and then a nickelback up here at the top of the screen. Now, in Patterson's base 4-2-5, that nickelback was traditionally a safety linebacker tweener, who played mostly as a down safety that could also fit against the run and in pressure. In Knowles' defense, that guy's really more of a nickel cornerback or a coverage guy, and this gives them access to a lot of coverages that you wouldn't necessarily see, at least in Patterson's base 4-2-5. Here, for example, Oklahoma State's playing a three-high version of a Tampa 2. So here, the nickelback and boundary safety will be your deep half players to each side, and then the free safety will drop into the intermediate hole to take away anything that tries to attack the space in between them. From this position in the intermediate hole, he's also in position to take away crossing routes or even to get involved in the box against the run. On top of that, when your nickelback can play over the top as a true deep coverage defender like this, it frees up the cornerback underneath of him to play aggressively against outside breaking routes and screens because he knows that he's got that deep help behind him. And here, that's going to lead to a very nice, very physical play to blow up a screen. So this is a coverage that gives you safety help to both sides of the field. It gives you strong perimeter coverage in the flats and it takes away crossing routes and other stuff toward the middle of the field. As a defensive coordinator, that checks an awful lot of threats off of your list of concerns. Where things get really good, though, is in all of the rotations and disguises that can come off of three high looks like this one. On this play, for example, it looks like the Cowboys are running the same thing, with the nickelback and boundary safety lined up as deep half players, and the free safety looking to rob the intermediate middle. After the snap, though, we'll see how the versatility of this three high coverage can cause problems for the offense. After the ball snapped, the Cowboys are going to roll to a single high coverage, so the free safety is going to roll down into the box as a 7th run defender in this short yardage situation, while the boundary safety rolls back to defend the deep middle of the field as a single high safety. The nickelback then is going to spin down in coverage on the slot receiver, and on this play that's going to let him blow up a bubble screen on 2nd and 1. Some of the stuff that was the most fun to watch in this defense, though, was just the sheer number of secondary rotations and safety spins, and how Knowles often got his guys into calls that were exactly what they needed against the passing concept that they were facing. On this play, for example, Texas wants to isolate their slot receiver on the defensive back that's lined up over him. That receiver's lined up on the hash, and so they want to force that defensive back to cover him on a corner route, working outside into all of this space toward the deep sideline. Now, based on this pre-snap look, the main guy who could screw that route up would be this cornerback on the outside here. He's lined up well outside of that slot receiver, and so if he were to just drop, he'd be in perfect position to take away the corner route. To prevent that from happening, Texas is taking the outside receiver that's lined up underneath that guy and running him on a slant, shallow into the inside. The idea here is that if that defender does drop to take away the corner route, then he'll be forced to give up that slant route underneath. If, on the other hand, the cornerback comes up to attack the slant, then they'll have gotten their one-on-one -on, -one on the corner out to the outside, and so this looks like a really well-designed route combination for the offense. After the snap, though, Knowles is going to invert those two defenders, so the inside defensive back is going to spin down and cut straight to that outside receiver, taking away the slant, and the cornerback is going to drop back to take away the deep sidelines, giving the Cowboys the perfect secondary rotation to take away Texas's biggest threats here. My favorite example of this coverage versatility, though, is probably this play. Here it looks again like we're seeing that three-high Tampa 2 coverage that we've seen before, with the nickelback and boundary safety playing deep halves, and the free safety playing the middle hole. Again, Texas is trying to create a high-low read on this cornerback up here at the top of the screen, a lot like we saw in the last play, so here it looks like the slot receiver is releasing outside for some kind of fade down the sidelines, and the outside receiver is running a slant back underneath him. Now remember that on the last play, the defenders lined up over those two receivers were inverting, so the inside man rolled down to take away the slant, while the cornerback dropped out to defend the sidelines. 
Are the Cowboys going to run something similar here? To find out, let's keep an eye on that inside defender after the snap. As the play begins, notice that that guy is not inverting down. He's instead bailing out to play a deep half. The quarterback's going to see this, and he's going to think that he's got that slant coming open into all the space underneath him. And a lot of his confidence in this throw is going to come from another well-designed passing concept from Texas. As I've said, before the snap here, it looks like the Cowboys are running that three-high Tampa 2 structure that we've been studying. So in that coverage, who would be the biggest threat to take away the slant? Well, from this alignment, that'd have to be this free safety here playing in the low hole, because if that guy really books it, he can potentially get outside to cut the slant off. To prevent that from happening, Texas is lined up in a trip set, and they're trying to take that guy out by attacking the middle of the field with their third receiver. If that guy attacks the middle, the idea goes, then the free safety will have to cover him, and nobody else will be in position to get to the slant. This is where things get really good, though, because here Knowles is actually rolling that free safety down into underneath coverage, and then dropping one of his linebackers back to replace him in the middle hole. This allows that linebacker to pick up the middle run-through, and it frees up the safety to do this. All that said, there were still some aggressive man coverages in there as well, although oftentimes those were where Oklahoma State was giving up their biggest plays. Here, for example, they've got all 11 defenders less than 10 yards from the line of scrimmage, and they're trying to defend this inside receiver and trips down at the bottom of the screen with a bracket from the free safety on the outside and a linebacker inside. After the snap, though, that receiver's just going to split those two defenders for a monstrous gain that never would have happened in any of the zone structures that I've just shown you. On this play, we'll see another coverage without any help over the top. Here, Iowa State's going to motion this receiver up at the top of the screen across the formation. As he works across, this safety playing in the middle of the field is going to lock onto him, rotating over to match him in coverage. After the snap, though, there's going to be some miscommunication between that safety and the nickelback who's lined up over this split-out tight end down at the bottom of the screen. The problem here is that once the ball snapped, that motion receiver who just came across the formation is going to push outside toward the flat. It looks like the nickelback's expecting some kind of a push call, and so he widens to pick that guy up, but the safety clearly isn't on the same page with him because he also jumps that route. Because of this miscommunication on the switch, neither guy picks up the tight end, and so he's able to run a corner out to the sidelines completely uncovered. So while I can point to a ton of cases in these two games where Knowles had a schematic advantage out of his three high zone rotations, there were some issues with execution, tackling, and angles that were clearly magnified when he left his guys without any help over the top. All right, that's it for this video. I'll be breaking down the most interesting coordinators from around the country throughout the offseason, so be sure to keep checking back on the channel, and I'll see you here next time.